Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy, Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern Spinebrook School of Medicine. Once is your COVID questions every Tuesday on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Mur Murphy will be answering viewers' submitted questions and addressing the latest, latest COVID headlines through today, the 28th of June. We invite you to submit your questions via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Leading the discussion today is myself, Sophie Bukowski, a student research assistant with the Institute. So Dr. Murphy, I'm gonna start with some updated COVID statistics. Good morning. In the United States yesterday, we saw 131,000 positive new cases with a seven day average at around 108,000 positive new cases with a 1% increase over the last 14 days. Also, we have now seen a 67.4% of the population in the United States is fully vaccinated with the booster shot rate still peaking at about 31%. Hospitalizations have increased by 6%, along with deaths have also increased by 3%. In Illinois, we have our fully vaccinated population is around 67%, with our seven-day average being about 3,000 positive new cases per day. And yesterday in Illinois, unfortunately, we saw nearly 10,000 positive new cases, with cases fortunately decreasing by 11%. Deaths and hospitalizations have also been decreasing in Illinois. What can you tell us about all of these numbers and what they exactly mean for the state and the pandemic that we are in right now? Well, the numbers are showing that the, the cases are, are at a very high level, but the severe consequences are, are not at a high level. Um, they're not great, but they are not following the cases. So in other words, the people that are getting infected are, are not getting severely ill not going in the hospital at the rate they used to go, not going into the ICU at the rate they used to go, and not dying at the rate they used to go. So um, all that means is that we have built up some kind of immunity that's keeping us safe from severe disease. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get sick and go to the hospital and even die from this thing yet. So, I mean, we have to be careful, particularly in the elderly, people with underlying immunocompromised conditions like certain cancers and, and other diseases, you know, they can still run into a lot of trouble. So they're the ones that, you know, really we need to protect at this point. If you look at the people that are dying, quite a few of them are vaccinated. Some of them are even boosted, but they have all sorts of other medical conditions and they're, they're much older. So um, it's becoming very much more like the flu now where, you know, the flu is, affects, you know, very young babies and, you know, mostly older people. Um, uh, and so, you know, it's, it, we're really evolving at this particular point. And most likely this is <clears throat> happening because of um, an increase in the community, cellular immunity. In other words, that's, that's immunity. Um, that's not just the antibodies but it's all the T cells and all the other ways that the body fights off this infection, very difficult to measure on a mass scale. It's almost impossible. So um, we're not measuring that. We just keep following antibodies and they go down, but there's this other parts of the immune system that are still working and, and helping people. So put that all together. You have people vaccinated. You have vaccinated people who are boosted. You have people that are boosted times two. Every one of those steps helps, right? right? And then you have people that have had COVID. Um, if you had COVID in 2020, it's probably not gonna, that kind of immunity probably not gonna help as much as if you had COVID in January or February or March. Um, so the newer COVIDs, uh, you know, are giving you a more relevant immunologic response. No, absolutely. And, you know, going right into our first COVID headline that talks about, you know, immunity and what that looks like is that summer has started in Europe, especially with such a high travel and tourism rate right now. But there is new COVID waves that are still occurring and are still continuing to spike. What can you tell us about BA4 and BA5 in um, European countries? Yeah, so BA4 and BA5 are, are accounting for up to up to 30 percent of the cases in the United States. Now. It just keeps increasing. Uh, in Europe, it's even more than that. In South Africa, where it was first identified, it's, it's most of them. Uh, so uh, it behaves about the same. Um, no big difference is not more severe or anything, but it is more contagious. And the estimates now are that it's 10 to 15% more contagious. To put it into perspective, when we had Delta 
And, you know, that was a more severe disease. And it was um, uh, more transmissible, more contagious than alpha and beta. However, when Omicron came in, Omicron was 300 to 600 times more contagious. And that's why we had that massive speak, peak in, um, in January and February. And even though that was a less severe disease, so many more people got infected that the hospitalization rates and, their, and death uh, increased. Uh, and then as that came down, uh, now we've got these, uh, this new variant here and the increase is, is much less uh, but it's behaving about the same in terms of its uh, ability to infect people, the severity. So, you know, um, and you can just see right now, it's already one of the most contagious diseases known to man. It's very close to measles, which is highly contagious. And, uh, you know, and that's why we're seeing so many infections now. I'm, I'm seeing more infections now, you know, almost as like January, but the people aren't getting sick. The other thing that's impacting the, um, the rates of hospitalization, and, and of course, uh, even more severe complications, is the use of Paxlovid, the, the drug that Pfizer makes, that's a combination of a protease inhibitor and, uh, and another drug that makes it <clears throat> uh, actually work uh, stronger. So it's actually two drugs in one. Um, that's had a big impact too, <clears throat> where it's being utilized. And, uh, you know, there were some stumbles uh, you know, right off the bat, getting the drug out there, finding it, getting a doctor to prescribe it or the pharmacist or whatever. But that, you know, that has worked out. And the production of Paxlovid, of course, the way the pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing process works, it's not like you just flick a switch and say, I need a million pills tomorrow. That is not how it works. You know, there's all the stuff has to come in to make it, all the ingredients, the packaging and all that other stuff. That all takes a while to build up. And now, you know, it's built up. And they're making it like you know crazy, and it's it's very available. So if you're in one of those high risk groups, you're over fifty, or you have any underlying disease, and you're maybe even down to twelve years old if you weigh eighty eight pounds, you can get Paxlovid, and uh, and that's having a big impact too. So we have, and that's whether you're vaccinated or not. So you know you've got the vaccines, the boosters, the number two booster, the Paxlovid. All that is really, you know, helping us control uh, this pandemic so that not too many people are ending up in the hospital. But to put it in perspective, there's still 300 plus people dying per day. Yeah. That's three times more on the average of people that die of flu, two times more what people die of accidents, two times more what people die of suicides. Other com These are other common causes of death. So, you know, it's, it's down at that particular level, but it's, um, it's certainly not gone away. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And uh, going into, you know, hopefully helping the death and hospitalization rate, uh, the, uh, the next and last big headline is the FDA is possibly moving forward towards updating vaccines. Um, what can you tell us about this approval that will hopefully occur today? So the big question is, um, just like with the flu vaccine, which is a different vaccine every year, the, the companies that make the flu vaccine, they don't have to do another clinical trial. Uh, if they did, by the time they did the clinical trial, the flu season would be over. Uh, so what, uh, what they're talking about here, I believe, is that um, uh, the new versions of the vaccine will have safety data and everything, but really they're just tweaking the vaccine, right? What they're, they're not, it's not like, it's a, it's a different version. It's not really a new vaccine. There's some semantical differences here, but uh, it's, I, I like to put it just in the analogy of the flu vaccine. So um, that, the one that's, go, that's going to come up, which now they say is going to be, uh, they have an October deadline, is based on Omicron. So you have the Omicron specific um, uh, proteins. And you know they're uh, going to be mixed with the older version of the vaccine together. And so you'll get this broader immunologic response and that'll be in October. So the question is, if you're due for a um, vaccine, a, a second booster or even a first booster, now, should you take it now or wait? 
I would say if you're eligible to take these vaccines, take it now. <laughs> because who knows if it really is going to be October. And then you can still take that one anyway. Or wait till November. Wait four or five months, whatever they're going to say that you uh, should wait. So I wouldn't wait because these numbers, over 100,000 per day. That's per day. That's like a million people every 10 days. That's, that's, that's really a lot. And, uh, and if you want, and they do help. They do reduce uh, the new infection rate. They do reduce the hospital rate. And they do reduce the ICU rate. And they do reduce the death rate. And there's even a difference between those that had one booster and two boosters. And the two boosters work better. And this is with the current vaccines. So that, that is really... The way you should go. I, you know, I, for most people, I wouldn't wait. There's uh, some conditions, like if somebody just had COVID last month, or, you know, so they're so have this hybrid immunity, they have the vaccine, plus they had COVID, uh, you know, and they're, they're waiting a couple months after they have the COVID before they take the vaccine. Uh, you know, maybe they stretch it out into uh, October now, uh, and wait for the version two. You know, that that's, uh, there's no right or wrong answer there. Uh, but uh, people have to make a decision. I would say the sicker you are and the older you are, the more you should really push that second booster now, yeah. no matter what happened last month. No, you're entirely right. And now for our COVID questions. Um, Dr. Murphy, for the first one, what is the status of the DARPA pan-corona vaccine slash what does that mean? Well, uh, there is a, another, uh, Moderna has another vaccine, uh, mRNA-1287, and it um, pr protects against the other coronaviruses that cause a common cold, two alphas and two beta coronaviruses. And together, those account for 10 to 30%, people usually say 20%, but there's a range, of course, of all the common colds. So nobody ever thought of uh, doing this before because you know nobody dies of the common cold, but it's still a circulating virus, and uh, you know these coronaviruses uh, can mutate and whatever. And whether or not this is going to help in the long run, we don't know. It could pre certainly prevent a lot of common colds, uh, and if you don't want to have common colds, you know this would be step one. So there's all sorts of other viruses, rhinovirus and adenovirus, that cause common colds. You know, maybe someday we'll have some vaccine that protects against almost all of them. Wonderful. Well, our second question is, my husband and I are 67 years old. We received two Moderna vaccinations with one Moderna booster received in November 2021. As they stay here, they can get the second booster. They're about seven months since their last booster. However, last month in May, at their doctor's annual visit, the blood work showed our F anti SARS COVID spike protein IGX index to be 8.69, indicating that at some point, without our knowledge, we had had COVID de and developed the antibodies. My question is, as this person is, since we do not know how long ago we had COVID, should they wait to get a second booster? And Dr. Murphy, can you explain what the heck is this protein IGX index yeah. that they are talking about? Okay. So, um, uh, First of all, I don't recommend anybody, except for some very unusual circumstances, to bother to get antibodies. I think it's a waste of time and money. Um, however, if you want to know if you had COVID, it's pretty simple. You can order a nucleocapsid protein antibody, which has nothing to do with the spike protein. It's another protein altogether and another antibody altogether. And it has nothing to do with any of the vaccines. Now, I'm actually unsure of this vaccine, if this is part of the spike protein that's not related to the vaccines or not. Uh, actually, I don't know. I'm going to have to look into it a little further. But spike protein, but the antibodies to spike protein are made from the vaccine. That's why the vaccine works. Spike is, is those little, um, if you've seen the pictures of the virus, those little things sticking out where the, which, uh, uh, is uh, where the virus uh, uh, attaches to the cells to infect them. Um, you know, I mean, that's the main target of the vaccines. Now, this specific, what they're looking here, um, yeah, I mean, the, the COVID can cause that because, I mean, that's what the whole game is about here. But, uh, but in any case, you don't, you don't really need 
to be measuring these things. And uh, the results are often confusing. And um, I would just answer this question um, the way that I was just talking about it. So we take a, people that are in their late 60s. Sounds like otherwise they're healthy. Um, but they're in the high risk group for something bad happening. And so should they wait until the new vaccine comes out in October now? I was saying last week, as, as early as last week, it was going, they were going to be out in September. Um, but the, it, now it looks like it's going to be October. This is not surprising because it's, it's hard to do all, get all this stuff, plus get it manufactured out, labeled and everything. Um, <clears throat> I would say they should take the second booster now if they're uh, four or five months out from the, the last one, uh, which it sounds like it is. So take that now. And then in the fall, when they're ready to take their flu shot and everything, the second booster, the version two, that what I talked about, will be available. And then they can have your their flu shot and their second version. That, that's what I would do because th these people are too too much at risk. It's just not worth it's not worth the gamble um, because we do know that second booster really helps. The death rate is half. The hospitalization rate is significantly reduced. And even the infection rate is reduced. Two, two shots versus one, two boosters versus one booster. So go ahead. They should go ahead and get the booster now. That's my recommendation. Wonderful. And now for our last COVID question. Uh, Dr. Murphy, how do you know if someone's no longer contagious after having COVID? Um, uh, yes, you're not supposed to get a PCR test for 90 days, but um, should you test an antigen? And lastly, when can an individual see someone who had COVID after eight days, after 10 days, after five days, et cetera? Well, we get versions of this question literally every day. So obviously the messaging is not working. Um, or could be improved, let's put it that way. But for one thing, the current, a couple of fundamental things, the current tests that we have are only good for making a diagnosis. They are not good for telling you when you are not infectious. That's a completely different kind of test that needs to be done. They exist, they're in research laboratories and they involve identifying a, a, and culturing a virus in the specimen. This is not gonna be done on a routine basis. Um, and, and specifically, the PCR test can test positive, like this person says, for up to 90 days, because it's just testing a very small particle of the virus that could be just laying around in the body that hasn't been completely cleared out of the body yet. That's completely useless. The antigen test does tend to, um, it appears a little later in the infectious process. I mean, by a little, like a day or so. And it does go away quicker because you have to have more of the virus around to, uh, to detect that. But it is not a test of infectivity. In other words, if you have a negative antigen test, you can still be contagious. So the CDC has made a very good recommendation. And that is after 10 days, very few people are infectious. So this is on this, the whole population level. And that's why the recommendations are that after, after you have developed symptoms and get diagnosed with COVID, or if you have no symptoms, the day of your first positive COVID test, whatever kind of test you had, you wait 10 days from then. And that first day is day zero, by the way. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And after day 10, you're free to go. Uh, and that's the safest way to do it. So the good thing about this virus is that it, it comes, it goes. Your immune system actually does a pretty good job if it, if it doesn't kill you first. <laughs> getting rid of the virus. And most of the people, you know, let's face it, uh, don't have severe disease or they're not at high risk at all. So just use the 10 day thing. So what happened is so many people clear this thing even very quickly to put people out of work or out of activity or, you know, out of circulation for a full 10 days when they have symptoms for one or two is kind of 
useless and you know counterproductive. So the current recommendation doesn't include any testing after you get diagnosed, which is good. And then at, after day five, you can go back out into the circulation with a mask, just in case you are still contagious and you wear the mask for another five days. And then <coughs> you can just be normal. So that, that's the recommendation. So, so the fundamental thing, the tests are good for diagnosis, not for follow-up. Wonderful. Well, that was very, very clear. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Well, I hope, I hope. <laughs> Yes, I get that. That question is also five times a day. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, everyone wants assurance. They want to be safe. You know, I, I, I wish there was an answer for you, but there's not. So you have to do the, the time thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Dr. Murphy, we'll, we will see you next Tuesday. Thank you so much. Yeah, after uh, July 4th. So have a great uh, holiday weekend. Yes. Bye.